Amen. I'd like to introduce you to this point uh, to Paul Nixon. Paul Nixon um, is our Path One strategist for the Northeast jurisdiction. Paul is a church planter, has been a church developer, and is now coaching um, many, many projects across the nation. So not only does he bring us the um, experiences on the ground, but he is also a wealth of information when it comes to other things that are going on around the country that we can that we can learn from and not have to try it ourselves. I am, I live in Washington, D.C., a couple hours. Well, more than a couple. It was about three and a half hours from here. And I am a United Methodist pastor. I've been working with New Start initiatives most of my ministry. And this is going to be fun today because we've got more than 20 different um, projects that could be incubating in your hearts and minds. And that's a lot of good dreaming that has come into this room. And so the, you've all seen the show um, Shark Tank. And um, this is not that. Okay? <laughs> we, we don't have a team of judges that's going to come out from behind the curtain. But the, um, Kay will be telling us about another event that's coming up, up in, a, in several weeks where some of the projects that are being developed today, you may decide to make a pitch and to, and to, um, and to try it, okay? We decided that that would be a, a great idea to encourage as many projects as possible and to see which ones were ready. But then we thought, you know, before we do that, we really should back up and, and do something to invest in just the dreaming and the, and the percolating and helping you get ready to frame up something for an event like that. So we said, we really need this day. And so we are here today with our dreams. Now, you have come with dreams in all states of development. Some of you are just really here with um, the vaguest of notions as to what God is about to do. And others of you, even as you were driving here, you were working on your little your plan. This dream that is in your hands First of all, it didn't come from you. It came from God. And we want, to be, we want to be tender with it because it came from God, plus the fact that right now you're mixing up some of your stuff with what God is putting here, and it's not refined yet. God is constantly revealing. Even when you get into the planting of something, you will discover on the ground that, that it's going to be revealed. More will be revealed. So I want you to hold this dream lightly today. And at one point, we're going to set it aside, and we're going to do some work, and then we're going to pick it up again. But, but just realize that we are going to challenge it a little bit, and especially some of, the, some of the assumptions and some of the baggage that we bring to our dream, so that the, at the end of the day, maybe we will be ready to see even more clearly what God is trying to do in our lives, and with our gifts, and with the, the, the communities of possibility that God has placed around us. So we're going to pray again with our dreams. Here, let's pray. God, we hold in our hands um, dreams, some of them already pretty well formed, in other cases very fuzzy, but in all cases we understand that you give us these dreams. We show up to your dreams, as they did in the book of Acts, and we do not know exactly what will happen, but we pray that you might perfect these dreams in us to that, so that they reflect your will of what you want to be doing in the world and in our community and the lives of people. So may your Holy Spirit help us to nurture well the dreams that you are stewarding with us or that we are stewarding for you. May you bless this day and help us not to be defensive but to be playful and to understand that this day is about nurturing your dreams into life. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can put your dream down over here. Okay, the, the first thing that we are going to be thinking about is about letting go of some of the stuff that we may have brought with us that is not necessary for the dream that God has. So unlearning is a very important piece of this process. I'm going to tell you just a couple of stories here about unlearning. I had um, a dreaming partner, um, African-American clergywoman, 
um, in Florida. In fact, she was the pastor of the church where my office was, was located when I was the church development person for the conference. And we were buddies and we would drink coffee together each week, and our coffee drinking became, shifted into church planting dreaming. She had grown up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and we were not in that conference, okay? That's West Ohio. We were in Alabama, West Florida. She'd grown up in Cincinnati, and I had had some connections with Cincinnati, and we decided to go to Cincinnati and prayer walk the place for four days. And in that, it was an amazing and wonderful four days. We fell in love with the city. She sort of re-fell in love with the city. We found ourselves with some others that were from that area that loved that city. And we found ourselves in a neighborhood called Over the Rhine. If you know Cincinnati, that's a, um, a, originally a German neighborhood that became one of the most um, um, poverty-challenged um, neighborhoods in the United States. Um, a largely African-American neighborhood that was, a, that was sort of a, a, a themed around um, um, conflict between white and black, okay? And we thought, you know, here we are as um, black and white being called to plant this church. There you go. They changed district superintendents right about a year before we were ready to go, and we came in to visit the new district superintendent, and he looked at us, and Pharaoh, he was. God hardened his heart, and it was dead right there. And Jackie wasn't with me at the time when I met with him, but I walked out of that, of, of that office, and I laughed all the way to the car, and I said, well, God, sometimes you make it very, very clear. And clearly that door slammed shut that day. Even though I like, I like big things, I do, but bigger is not always what God is doing. And in the multiplying church, the big learning right now is you don't build 2,000-seat arenas because it's going to lock you into a $10 million problem. And then, 20 years from now, you may not be able to fill it, and you're not going to be nimble. And so I'm working with this church in Oklahoma, and they just keep filling the 180-seat spot. And then they did it twice, and now they're doing Saturday night. And then they, they say, how many times can we do this? I said, well, you can then do it somewhere else. And it's forcing them to multiply, multiply, multiply. They will go farther just multiplying and replicating and getting into new places than if they were trying to fill one thing. Bigger is not always better, um, and yet the kingdom can e explode with a proliferation of small things. Pastors are expensive and you need a building. The United States, we do church in a very, very expensive way. This expensive building, this expensive um, ministry model that we've created is not working well in the 20th century, 21st century. It worked fine in the 20th. It's not working well. And it's not a nimble method. What we learned from other parts of just our denomination in the third world is that we are growing the fastest where we spend the least amount of money. What's that? Or we have the least amount of money. So basically, where pastors are bivocational and where the buildings are just borrowed and rented and so forth, they just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. When we become locked down to a model of having to have full-time pastors with all those benefits and to and staff, a heavily staff-driven model and a heavy, a heavy building model, especially with old buildings, interesting old buildings that have roofs and systems, and um, they get very, very expensive. And where churches are not as big as they used to be, this is knocking us out. Part of what we want you to be thinking about is how can we do church in an era where this is knocking us out? If you have to get to a $200,000 income in three years in order to hang it, to hang in there. There's getting to be less and less places in the world where you're going to be able to get to $200,000 income in three years, and, there's, and, and yet God wants church in all those places. God wants Jesus to be um, um, shared and, 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 and for lives to be transformed in places where this business model does not necessarily work. So, and it might work in the long run, but in the short run, what are you going to do 
in order to be able to hang in there through the lean years, the missionary years, as you're trying stuff and think, sometimes you try something and it doesn't work the first time and you need to try it again and you got to kind of play with it. That's what innovation's about. That's what the whole book of Acts was about. And we, we make a lot of assumptions here. What if we didn't have to spend all that money? What if we gathered on Thursday? What if we could partner with another group? What if people could belong to more than one church? What if um, nobody is looking for a good church at all, and yet God is calling us to be in that community? What if we are drawn to, and people in our community are drawn to, um, compelling communities that can gather in a living room and really get real and talk about the most important things in life? to our market. What if, um, let's see, what if the people look kind of rough? What if we um, do the right stuff and the growth doesn't come at first? What if, um, what if people are actually making time for the things that are, that are compelling for them in their lives, which they are? Um, there are certain things we just simply will make time for because they're important and we just can't live without those things. What if there's no live music leader but a good DJ? I led a, a retreat uh, for um, spiritual innovators in Estes Park, Colorado last summer, and we had a DJ, a seminary trained DJ from Atlanta came and did the music, and, and, and we would just say, okay, we need something that's kind of like this. He could go to Christian music, he could go to secular, he just had this, he's a, a DJ for one of the major radio stations in Atlanta in the morning show, and um, a really good DJ. I would plant a church with him because the range of what he was able to do in that room was more than any worship band I've ever known. Why do we assume, we assume lots of stuff around music. And, um, the language we use. Okay, so it might be that there is some aspect, that we, either one of these things or something we haven't named, that you might want to hold lightly as we, um, as we proceed today. He just won't name, he just won't connect God with it, but he talks about, um, he talks about presencing. He talks about, you know, um, being open to that intuition which comes from beyond ourselves. Basically, he, he stole our stuff. And, and, and it's interesting how when his material, um, my co-author with Weird Church was using his material, working as a consultant with Nike, and she found it quite odd that here she was consulting with Nike, and they were all basically doing this, and she said, and she goes, then she goes to her United Methodist Church meeting, and there's just a little prayer at the beginning, and there's none of this. And she said, what's wrong with this? That we are not, um, that we are not attentive to the Spirit leading us. So in theory, you basically, it works like this. And some of you have had me as a professor, and you've heard me do my theory you talk. But um, there's a you process that's going to be a little bit of the process of today, it's the process of any church plant, and, it, it, and, it, and it's, a, it's a repetitive process. And it starts, we start here. This is where we begin right here. That is baggage to your idea. And we download these things because we're in the habit of, we're, it's just, it's habitual. And it's the downloading of past patterns that were developed in another day and another time with another group of people. A lot of the patterns and habits that we as United Methodists have were developed decades ago, working in a very different cultural context, and we still kind of hold on to these assumptions. And we download that. And what Theory U is, is trying to help stop that download. Let's be open to what's kind of going on right now. So there's a, there's a, we start by saying, taking a breath, laying our dream, and also some of our assumptions on the, on the table, and we're going to move into a season of listening, watching, 
observing, open. And we're going to say, God, what do you need to show me that I really need to see that I'm not yet seeing? We're observing, we're listening, we're having conversations, we're, we're allowing all this to accumulate, and um, we've got our vision, but we're also open and we're in this observation mode. And I am looking all over for my little clicker. If anyone sees it, I have a way of losing my clicker, which I've already done today. Um, but anyway. Um, and then we reflect and we allow the spirit to sort of take what we're learning and to take that with our core values and our faith and to help us process. And then... What happens? The, the exclamation mark, the cloud bubble thing, the aha. Wait, what if we dot, dot, dot? And when you get to the what if, Otto Schammer would say, don't create a committee and study it for three years. <laughs> You'll kill it if you do that. And don't create a $6 million plan, because that's going to take a long time, too. Don't even create a $600,000 plan. Do something immediately to test your aha. And you don't have to have the bishop's appointment to test an aha. I'm constantly working with would-be church planters that I have one woman, she says, I've been living at the bottom of the U for four years and I'm just waiting for God to show me something and I want to say, whoa, time out. Just because you haven't found that place where the conference sees your gifts ready to plant something and they're willing to put, does it mean that in the place where you are right now, you could be trying some stuff. You could be trying some stuff and saying, well, wasn't that an interesting experiment? And maybe one of those things would work and, and be a major aha to you that would show you where you need to go next. Or you might discover that it thrives and flourishes so much that you just have to work with that. The guy that was the planter of the Urban Village Church that I coached, well, he moved to England. And he's now the church developer. He's the K Kotan for the British Methodists, okay? Part time. But while he was there, he didn't have a, I mean, he was doing some coaching for my organization, but he had a lot of time on his hands. And he said, Birmingham, England. Well, I guess we might as well, you know, let's start a couple of small groups, you know, and that's, that's what church planters do. Let's, let's get some people together. Let's get some people that aren't, that aren't connected as well as they might be to um, faith community and so he gets some of these little small groups meeting, and they're meeting in the pubs and wherever, and they say, let's have a worship service. You know, okay, let's have a worship service. Well, the next thing he knows, 90 people show up for the first worship service. And he was looking for, what is it that I need to be doing? And God just showed him right here. And I said, that was kind of like an unexpected baby when you're 42, you know, and all of a sudden, whoa, okay, so we have a baby. When 90 people show up for a worship service, you can't just say, well, wasn't this lovely, and, and say, have a great life. <laughs> people work for years to find 90 people, and they just, and it just like happened. Why did it happen? It happened because the Holy Spirit was showing them some stuff and said, look, right here, you, in this way, you can connect and gather folk. Whatever it was that they did that led to those 90 people, that's not something that's very common right now in the British Methodist Church. So they got to pay really close attention to that. That was a surprise. It was an aha. It was not a part of a strategic plan. It did not come with some gigantic grant. It just happened, and it's like, oh, we've got 90 people. Now, when you have 90 people show up for your first worship service, then you go and you say, okay, um, we just were playing with this and 90 people showed up. All of a sudden, Kay's very, very interested. You were, you were just messing around and all of a sudden 90 people showed up. Let's talk. Let's talk about what are you learning about that? Who are these 90 people? And why did they just kind of surprise you that day? Um, it's often in the acting in an instant. Sometimes we act in an instant and, you know, I, I, I started a children's ministry one time and two showed up. I said, well, this didn't work. Some of you um, familiar with fresh expressions? 
Mike Breen. Mike Breen, his, instead of a U, he goes around this way. It's like a traffic circle. So you're, instead of coming this way, he's, um, he's British. He goes the opposite direction, okay? So he goes this way, and a few of us are going to have an aha today. It may be crazy ahas, but we're going to have an aha. And, we, we, and what we're going to do with that aha is not to, to, um, to go out and act, but we're going to begin to form some, some ministry ideas. Okay? And that ministry idea may approximate what you have been dreaming about. Or it may be a little bit different. And that's okay. And that's not to say, at the end of the day, we're going to come back to the thing you've been working on, and we're going to see how it looks different in the light of this exercise. But, but what we're going to do right now is we're going to play a game. I would and like for you at your table to think of a challenge that you would like to create a solution to. And this challenge could be something um, that's related to people who live in a typical community in central Pennsylvania, okay? It's a, it, and it could be related to a challenge with church, or it could be a challenge just in the lives of people. It could be related to um, raising kids. It could be related to the drug crisis. You all need to decide on a challenge at each table, okay? So I'm going to let you just take one minute to just pick one, okay? I need a challenge. Okay, do you have a problem named at each table? Yes, okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to come up with the most ridiculous, the most ridiculous and outrageous and silly bad ideas that we can think of to solve that problem. No good ideas allowed, okay? So we're, this is, these are ideas in the family of we're going to have Oprah jump out of a, of a helicopter with a parachute and float down to the, foot, the, to the, to the football field, okay? And there's going to be a crowd that's going mean, to it's that level. Silly, ridiculous ideas. I want bad ideas, okay? I don't want good ideas. I want really ridiculously bad ideas. Go. And I want you to list as many of them as you can. So someone needs to be a scribe and just write the bad ideas. Do not dwell on them. Just keep it moving. List them. Go to the next one. <coughs> I would like for you to, to look down one on your list and to say, could we find something with that particular idea that we could fix? That we could, is there some, one of those ideas, is there something there in one of those ideas that might be like hidden um, underneath the illegal and the immoral and the ineffective and the arrogance? You know, is there something there that might be a, a workable 
kind of, it's a little bit crazy, but there might be something workable. I want you to look at your list and say, is there any of those that there might just be, if we chipped away at it, there might be a nugget of, of brilliance there in, on that crazy thing? Just look at your list and just see, is there one that could, could be fixed? Well, you can see how this works. Sometimes there's things that, because they get associated with the bad idea list, it's just they, they are, we're, we're, we're not thinking broadly enough and creative enough. And, we, and it's sometimes out of the silly ideas that we, that we can stumble onto really great ideas. And so, um, yeah, you gotta take out the, the, the killing part. You know, that's, but, but somehow, there might be that there is, within that bad idea, a, a bit of genius that can sort of help us to rethink um, what we're working on. Okay, um, the last thing I would like for us to do, and you can stay in your groups here, is I would like for us to ask a question. And that, is, that question is this. What business are we in? And when I say business, um, I don't mean we're not starting a business. We're not a for-profit organization. But we, but the the gospel is an enterprise. Um, it is an it is a, an organized action. Um, it is a community that is mobilized for action, and specifically to do certain things. Um, I think for a lot of folks the business that the church has been in for the last few years, we have thought of it as we are in the business of gathering Christians together on Sunday to remember that they are Christians and to be comforted and strengthened to be Christians. Okay? That's what we do. Okay? That's the business we're in. And, I mean, you can almost look at a church and you can figure out, what business are these people in? You look, you look at the back of the bulletin, the, all the activities, and you could say, well, they're in the business of fellowship. They're in the business of Christian fellowship. Or maybe they're in the business of something else. They may be in the business of trying to help a certain population. But what is the business that we're in in a way that is going to be compelling and interesting and relevant to the people that, are, that God has placed on your heart? I'd like for you to think about that individually for just a moment. What is the business that we are in? And that I'd like for you to discuss, because be, there may be some different kinds of answers at your table, but I'd like for you to start just with yourself. What is the core of what we are about? What are we trying to do together?
The reason that I'm asking this question is because I don't want you to be in the church business. I want you to be in the gospel business. And the church, anything we do as church is to serve the essence of the gospel. I want you to be driven by your understanding is what is the good news? What is the good news for this community? Um, what do we need to be doing to live out the good news? Another way you could say it, you can be in the kingdom of God business. But the church as an organization just simply serves this greater thing. I want you to be focused on that and not simply creating another church. We have plenty of churches. Um, we probably need to even consolidate. We, got, we have a lot of churches. Most communities, the question would be, we've got so many churches here, why in the world do we need another one? And if you're a church planter, you better have a good, a good answer to that. And it's not because we need another one, it's because we are, are driven so that this, with a, a vision that this community can have, you name it. And it has to be more than just another church. When you look at what business was Jesus in, he said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. So Jesus was in the, in the business at one level of offering a different kind of life to people. So the way of Jesus is just a whole new way of existing. Planting a church tells us the what, but it doesn't tell us the why. Jesus told us his why. He told us why he came. And what is your why? What is the why? That is the business that you are in. Um, so as you think about that for just a moment, what is your why? Why are you here today? All aside from that little dream that's over here, that's a what. We'll keep, we'll keep that alone. Why? Why? There is a one-on-one a -on -one conversation that I use in training. I'm not going to use it at this event, where in the one-on-one, -on -one, the person that's interviewing the, com the person in community asks, what, what do you, tell me about yourself, and she starts in talking about her profession. And then they go a little deeper, and he says, well, how did you get into that profession? And then she's still, it's kind of at the surface level, and and her name is Eunice. But finally he says, but why did Eunice do this? And then she goes down, she goes deep to a story of a near-death experience um, when, she was, um, when she miscarried. And she was actually out for like two days and almost died. And when she came back, she realized that her life had been given back to her. Her why was to be able to give back in celebration of the fact that she was alive, okay? Well, that's pretty deep. But until you understand that, you don't understand Eunice, of what was, what was driving her. She was being driven by a profound calling to give back. And so any kind of community that she was planting was going to be a community of giving, giving, giving back. It was going to be all about giving. Um, what is your why? And where does it come from? as you think back in your life.
So that, that um, dream that you set aside, well, we're going to pick it up now. We're going we're to bring it back. And I would like for us to do a little bit of reimagining around it. Um, and it might be that at the end of the day, it looks kind of like what it did at the beginning, or it may change a little bit. But as we, as we imagine with it, I would be asking these questions. What is the pressing need in the community where you're, where you're dreaming that is catching your attention? What are you seeing? Or, an, or my friend Tom Bandy sometimes says, who is the population for which your heart breaks? Um, who, who, the, who is it that so deeply um, touches you and um, draws you in? Uh, another way we say that sometimes is, for whom do you have affinity? And that doesn't mean that you're necessarily like them. You can have affinity for a population that has a very different story than your story. But who and what um, um, do you see in your heart's vision when you think about that community? What is a simple response to what you're seeing that is faithful and that carries the gospel into that community? Okay. How can we carry the gospel toward that need or toward that population? How would you pay for it if traditional funding mechanisms were not going to pay for all of it? Or if you couldn't predict the amount that participants would give at first? How would you, um, how would you fund it? How would you create a sustainable um, platform for it? And in terms that would make sense to the people that you want to love in that community, what business are you in? I'd like for you to think about those things for just a moment. And just individually, or if you came as a team, you can chat with your team member. But I would like for you to think about that in light of all that we've done this morning. Some of you came without a particular um, dream or plan or scheme or idea. Maybe it was very fuzzy. Others of you are really working some specific, you're, you're really cooking on an idea. I, how do these, does this morning cause you to um, clarify these things? In past conversations, the, sometimes the breakthrough at the bottom of the U has been the discovery that rather than pitching another church to the community, what we're really doing is pitching hope to a community as contained in these particular um, aspects of what we're going to be building. But, but, but the language changes into a way that even for people that are not necessarily oriented to church, they would be engaged by what we're, what we're up to. Just for, for kicks and grins, I would like for you to name your thing, your idea. And you could call it um, the um, Mechanicsburg Project. Is that a place, Mechanicsburg? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought so. I thought so. Um, I think I stayed in a Holiday Inn Express there. You just, or you could call it whatever you want to call it, but we need to give it a, na a working name for, so that we, 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 it needs a working name for you to be able to develop it. So whatever you want to call this thing you might have cook, been cooking on, whatever this is that you kind of hold like this, um, let's, let's give it a, a, at least a tentative name, and you can put that at the top of your piece of paper. And as you think about your, um, this thing, I would like for you to maybe uh, to just put some notes to yourself on that piece of paper that address these questions here because these are important issues. That obviously this piece here, how are you going to pay for it if you couldn't predict the amount of participant giving, that is a bore to your community. But to the conference and to, the, to, the, um, to us here, it's not a bore. <laughs> it's a really important piece. Um, however, this is extremely important to your community. So, 
depending on who you're talking to, you may dip into different pieces of this, but these are all important. So just make some notes to yourself on your page um, related to, to those four items, just to give yourself so, so you can, um, so you don't forget any, any pieces of that that you want to hold on to a little bit later today. In some cases, you are imagining a, um, a fresh expression of faith community that will be attached to, connected with a church or two, but that itself will not be um, a, a church in the fullest sense, but it will be a, a place of powerful faith, faith community connected to a church that has all of the other pieces and parts. Um, in other cases, you may be thinking of a, of a faith community that is church in every possible way. That's fine. In all cases, we're thinking about faith-based community. We're thinking about a place where people find a sense of spiritual home. We're a place where People's lives experience the gospel, and they experience um, God's transformation. In all cases, we're thinking about that. And as you work in this community, in the early processes of starting a ministry, you're going to be looking for the overlap between your sense of why and the energy in that community so that, that there's a coming together, there's a, there's a larger why that is pretty broadly based. And on the basis of that, you can plant something. Okay, if you'll flip your page over, you can write more. You keep, you'll keep thinking of stuff in writing, but flip your page over. And then this is where you're going to need some post-it notes. On each post-it note, what you're about to do is I want you to write down an idea of something you could do toward the end of what's on the other side of the page, okay? So it's an activity. It's, it could be a, an aspect of ministry. It could be a one-time event. It could be um, some kind of a community meetup. It could be a, but it's something you can imagine doing as a part of this ministry. And I want you to put more down than you could ever possibly do, and some of them that you wouldn't possibly even want to do, but, but I want you just to imagine possibilities. What are some ideas, no filtering, that you could think of doing in your community toward the end that you have, that you have um, imagined? One idea per post-it note, and I'd like for you to cover the back of your thing with post-it notes, okay? So, you know, one idea is to um, have a, um, a blessing of the animal service at the dog park, okay? That's an idea, all right? That may be a crazy idea or a good idea or just irrelevant where you are, but that's just an example of just a, an idea. I want lots of ideas, most of which you will never do, so that you're not committing to anything by putting it on the post-it note. All you're committing to is to fill your page so Paul Nixon will, will, be, will say, well done, all right? You're committing to filling it, your page with ideas of things we could do toward this end that might be fun to do. And I want you to take a few minutes and do this. Go.
as you look at all those ideas that are appearing on post-it notes, you can move the post-it notes around. Are there a couple of different themes? Do they belong in sort of different groups? Could you move them around? Or are there some that deal with kids or families? Are there others that deal with a specific need in the community? Um, are there some that are um, outdoors? Are there some that have to do with worship? I mean, just kind of begin to look and kind of group them around if, there, if there's some that, if they begin to fall in different patterns, because that's important. Pay attention to that. You may not see the patterns yet. And again, you're not committing to doing any of this, but you're just playing with ideas re relative to your vision. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to, I'm going to give you an assignment and you can go out into, this into God's beautiful world if you want. You have 45 minutes, okay, to, it's, this is workshop time. You can take a friend with you and you can work on two ministries, um, yours and hers. You can do that or however you want to use this time, but here's your assignment. I want you need to take a, piece, a blank piece of paper. If you do not have one, there are lots right here. With this blank piece of paper, we are going to fold it as a trifold. This is how I do my trifolds, like this, so that it has a front. And then I open it, and there's another page. And then I open it all the way, and it's got six panels, right? That's my trifold. On this little trifold, I'm going to suggest, okay, look here. I'm going to suggest that this be the cover, okay? And you can, you can have a little stick figure, um, or some of you do better than stick figures, but you can have a little stick figure um, logo, you know, or you can just do a scribble that there, there'll be a logo. Logo goes here, you know, and kind of put you know, a tentative name for what you're doing. Um, but that's the cover of what you're trying to pitch, okay? Now, as you do this, you open it up. Right here is the first page you're looking at. So that would be this page. As, as we're doing this, that's your big idea. Your big idea goes here. That's your pitch. If I don't read anything else, whatever goes there is the short version. It's the elevator version. It's, the, it's, the, it's gotta be the, the stuff that grabs me there that tells me what are you up to, okay? So, you, so this is the cover, and then this is your big idea, and then in the middle, this can be like contact information stuff. Okay, then there's the other side, the innards of your little brochure. And I got to thinking about what, what, what could you put in there? And so you might have a section on the why, and you might even talk about what are the deep community longings and needs that, are, that sort of undergird this, this ministry. Um, why is this something needed? What are people really longing and, and, and hoping for in their lives that, that this ministry is connecting with. Then the how is, tell us about some of the little glimpses of what's going to happen. And if you, were, if you were pitching this to a conference 
committee that was going to give you some funding. The how might have a little sense of we're going to start with this, and then we're going to do this. It might even be a little bit of a timeline kind of thing, but not too much, okay? Not, not getting into the weeds. Just big picture, um, we, we're going to do this and this and this and this. But if you were pitching, if you were doing this brochure to put in the hands of a person in your community, it might give glimpses of three different kinds of ministries that go on um, as, a, as ways of sort of getting a, a handle on what this is. And then this panel right here, what difference are we trying to make in this community? What is the difference that means that this is worth an investment of my time, my family time, my church energies, my tithe. Why would I want to invest in it? And more and more these days, it's people have to see the bang before they invest. I mean, there was a time when our grandparents just trusted there was going to be some bang somewhere, and they put their... They put their their resources, and their time in, trusting that there was bang happening somewhere. Their grandchildren are not that way. And unless we can see and believe that it's making a difference in our lives, in our kids' lives, in the lives of the world, probably we're not showing up and our money's not coming along. So what is the bang, the bang that we want to see how the world is going to be different, how people's lives will be different and blessed because of this. Now, you can do your thing any way you want it, but I, this, but I wanted to give you um, a, um, an easy way to kind of make a brochure. And the reason for the brochure is that the, the, the little flyer, the trifold flyer, the reason is because this is a very good method for helping you to just sort of think through what am I trying to share with someone else. And this actually will feel more tangible than just a speech with a bunch of talking points. It will just feel more tangible to you. So it's a good method. So you're going to fold your page into thirds. You can actually fold it differently. You don't have to do any of this if you don't want. If you've got a better idea, you can make paper airplanes um, for, all, for all I care. Um, just have whatever works for you. And think about what is attention grabbing that something should know. So in the big idea, you're trying to grab attention here. And um, then you may want to have a, a one of these panels that instead of um, the how or instead of contact, it's a call to action. It's an invitation. It's a like what, what, how you can help. So that would be an alternative to the contact is, you know, how can I get involved kind of a thing. That would be, a, that would be cool. You might decide to do that. I'm going to suggest you work on your brochure, and, we're gonna be, and you can share it with other people and get ideas. I don't care. But we're going to be back here. We're going to go down to the, to, no, we're not going down to the restrooms. We'll use the restrooms on this level. We're going to be back here by 10 minutes until 2, until 3, 10 until 3, and then we'll go into um, kind of a, a group sharing time, okay? 10 to 3, all right? Have any questions? Have fun. Have fun. So I, I love the energy in the room and the excitement in your voices and everything that's brewing in this room. So uh, I, just, I just thank you for coming with an open mind and just allowing this process to unfold. So what Paul has asked me to kind of share with you is um, what kind of things uh, make my heart stop? <laughs> what kinds of things do we get excited about from, from the congregational development team standpoint, especially if you're wanting to come for um, funding uh, at 
uh, the spark tank, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. So as I describe those things, um, sometimes it's kind of hard to put words around those kind of projects or initiatives um, that we all get excited about and, you know, I can't sleep at night kind of things. But I think the, the one thing that as um, I was thinking about how to describe um, those kind of projects is it has a compelling vision. And I'm going to save the world or I'm going to make disciples. Well, that's our mission. That is not a compelling vision. You know, a vision is something that you can't sleep at night about. A compelling vision is something that is at the top of your tongue, the tip of your tongue, and you can't wait to share it with somebody else. You're so excited about it, and your energy and your excitement is contagious because you can paint that picture so clearly that other people want to be a part of it. Does that make sense? So compelling vision of, of impact is, is something that really excites me. Um, for those of you that have heard me um, speak at all, this next one is not going to be surprising to you whatsoever, but I think it has to be relational, relational. We too many times do lots and lots of good things for people, but we miss the relational component. So how are we building relationships with folks in an authentic way? So not a bait and switch, not a, I want you to do this, but really, I want to get to know you, journey alongside you, do life with you. And people feel that in their bones, and therefore, they're going to walk alongside you, and you're going to build a, a relationship enough that you can then talk about why God, why a church, and then why my church. Because too many times we've got to the point of we understand we want people to have this life with Jesus like we have, and we have been taught that we just invite him to church. And, and friends, there's so much in between that the work has to be done that we sometimes just want to get from A to Z in one leap, and it just doesn't work, especially in our suspicious world of today. So what's the relational component of walking alongside people um, so that you do eventually get to share Jesus? Um, the, the other thing is, what is the discipleship piece? What is the piece where you're going to help people grow in their love and relationship with Jesus Christ? Okay? So, so this is where um, we, we sometimes struggle. We've done a whole lot of good deeds, but we have not ever shared the good news. Right? And so not to say that those good deeds are a bad thing. They're called good for a reason. But it's only half of the equation. And so we have a whole lot of projects out there that do a lot of good for folks, but they're not relational, and they're not helping people become disciples of Jesus Christ, okay? So that's the other piece that I would be looking for, is what's the discipling piece? And, and here's the other piece, is especially as we think about fresh expressions and doing church in very unconventional ways outside the church walls, which I believe that's probably where we're going to have to end up doing most of our work in today's world. Our buildings are way expensive, and again, people out in the world usually don't want to have anything to do with our buildings and what what we're doing inside, right? So we have to be, we have to present ourselves differently. And I'm not saying compromise the gospel. See, that's where I think we get hung up too. We're not compromising the gospel, but we're showing up in a contextual way that is relatable to the people that we're trying to reach. But we do too many things where there's no relational component and there's no discipleship component. But at the same time, as we go out and do new things, even if it has all of those components, if it's not tethered somehow to the church, and I call that the big church as opposed to a building, as opposed to your congregation, because at some point, um, your small group may, okay, if, especially I'm talking fresh expressions or an extent, ex a ministry that's extended from your church, where's the, t the tether back to the congregation? Now, I use tether lightly. It's not a rope. It's not a chain. But if people are, are developing their discipleship pathway and they want to be baptized, if there isn't a, a tether back to the church, how are we going to handle that? What does communion look like? What does marriage look like? All of those pieces that, that the bigger church can offer. Or 
we're doing kayak ministry or fill in the blank ministry over here and then children suddenly come into part of the family then how are we doing the children's component so how can we be offering a more comprehensive approach that's not where we start friends but we also can't um, keep that out of the equation either okay so how do we how do we go out and do these new things in very innovative ways but also have this light tether to the back to back to the church we have to keep our wesleyan roots right what are our wesleyan roots around discipleship and having people get to know jesus but do it in a very different way than four walls and a chapel and a steeple and so those are the things that are really exciting to be hearing about. You all can dream much bigger dreams than, than I have. And Paul made fun of me with my arms out wide. I was holding all 21 of, of your projects in this room and all the things that are being dreamed out there. Um, it's an exciting time in the Susquehanna Conference. Um, we, we want to just open up the possibilities of anything to happen. Um, but, but friends, we do not need more um, social projects. We need people who want to be in relationship with people and, and allow them to get to know Jesus through relationships with us. And to me, if you hear nothing else, I want you to hear that. And not to say that all those social programs aren't good. Please don't hear that. But we're doing a way great job around that. And all of those things are good. But we're doing that in lieu of relational ministries that lead people to know Jesus. So that's what gets my heart ticking at this point. And um, I'm hoping to, to hear lots of ideas as you all begin to um, present. Mm -hmm. So um, the uh, congregational development team is going to be coming together. The congregational development team is a team that works with my office of clergy and laity. Um, um, there's a group of about 10 or so of us. And um, we're responsible and accountable to um, you, our annual conference for the grant money that is um, is issued for new church ideas, and that that's a large expansion of new pe new places for new people. So the Spark Tank um, is a next step. Um, you will any uh, any people that did not come to the Spark Starter today will not be eligible to come to Spark Tank. So this was a prerequisite. So aren't you glad you're here? Um, the Spark Tank is an opportunity for you to come before the, uh, the committee or the, the team on congregational development for you to pitch your idea. And it may be the idea that you walked in here with today and, and continue to develop. Or as a part of this process or the Holy Spirit moving, this allowed you to think of a, of a different dream, a bigger dream, a better dream, a different dream. So um, if you're interested or need um, some funding, then we're inviting you to um, fill out an application for the Spark Tank. And it, much of the things that you put in the brochure and many more questions will be asked of you. Um, and you can fill out that application. And then um, if you kind of go through the first kind of screening to meet some of those things that I just talked about, um, then you'll be given a slot on that day. Um, we're, we're working from Mount Asbury. Um, that was just the place that was, um, that was available. So Mount Asbury Retreat Center. Um, and you will be given a spot to come and present your new ministry idea for consideration for funding. So if you're interested in that, you'll need to email my office at EVC, like e Equipping Vital Congregations, EVC office at susumc.org. And we'll be glad to give you the application for consideration. All right, very good. For, for, for some of you, um, I realize we're at all at different places. Has today been able to help you a little bit in terms of thinking ahead on what you're thinking about? Have you made any progress at all in terms of sensing that? Um, were there any ahas at the bottom of the U today for anybody? I guess that's what I'm asking. Any sort of like, oh, oh. Anybody? 
Would anybody like to tell, just to share what might have shifted today or what ahas you had? You don't got to give us the whole story, but was there any particular um, thing that you realized at some point, oh, wait a minute, we could do this? We were making a, minister, a pivot at the very end of that to think and to rethink the whole thing you had just done in terms of a faith community development, but you could start that whole sheet again thinking of a church plant, but thinking of a church plant that had to be related to a particular need, and, and, and you could go through the same exercise and really integrate that. But, um, but every piece of that board is relevant to the ministry projects that are on your brochures. Every single movement there is relevant to what you're doing, even though you're not necessarily solving the problem that was, um, that was given to you. Um, and the brochure, was the brochure exercise helpful for you in clarifying your thinking some? Yeah, that's been my experience with that one, is that, um, there's a lot of different ways you can sort of put it in there, but the uh, and and the first time that I did this, people said we can't make a brochure that we're not creative enough. But but the um, my experience is is it helps. And by the way, here's what I want you to do with your brochure. You can take a picture and send it to Kay or not. But here's what I would love for you to do with your brochure. It fits so nicely in your Bible. Okay, and when you go to your Bible, open it up and pray over it, and then just stick it there. That's just a good place for it to just be marinating in good stuff, okay? It's a Bible, it's a Bible piece. And over the years, I've discovered that when I was, de there's something that I'm working on, just to keep the notes just folded up in my Bible, it, it, it's staying connected with my ongoing conversation with God, which is what your brochure needs to be connected to. All right. Well, friends, um, I think we are just about at the end of our time. Um, we have done that, and ta-da. Okay, we're here. So have a good ride on the way home. Sometimes the drive home after an event like this is, is the bottom of the U, where it's like, oh, my goodness. And so... Um, um, if you need to pull over and make your notes, don't try to do them driving. <laughs> but, um, but I hope it's a good, uh, I hope that you're driving and in your sleeping and in your sharing with friends, either on the road or when you get home, I hope that you continue to experience the movement of God's Spirit in your life. And I'm excited for what God is doing in your conference and in each of your lives. And I'm glad that you're here today. Thank you for giving a day to do this. So. Thank you.